to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free john chapter 8 verse number 32. we welcome you today to our study of answering denominational doctrines today we're comparing the doctrines and teachings of the cowboy church with that of the bible in the new testament and friend, as we consider these things today, all we ask of you is to have your Bible handy and look to the Word of God with us to see if the things spoken are true to the Bible. As always, we're glad that you joined us for our study of the Word of God today. We want to encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would, area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night, they'd be happy to have you stop by. They'd love to sit down and study the scriptures with you or maybe have a home Bible study. Contact the local congregation in your area and they'd be happy to do that. Friend, we also would love to help you in your searching of the scriptures as well here at the Gospel of Christ. From our website, thegospelofchrist.com, we have a wide variety of free Bible study resources. All our videos are available online as well as audio. We have written transcripts of that as well. You can download all that from our website. If you'd like to have a, a free copy for later study, whether it be on DVD or CD, we can make that available to you as well, free of charge. Just write to us or call us or email us, visit our website. You can fill out a media request form and we'll mail that to you as well. But more than anything, we just simply want to encourage people today to study their Bible, to check for yourself if what we're doing and how we're living is true to the Word of God. Today we think about the doctrines of the cowboy church. And friend, from the outset we realize there is absolutely nothing wrong with the cowboy culture. We have nothing against the cowboy culture, uh, country lifestyle, uh, things of that nature. That's all good and well if that's what someone desires. But what we're thinking about is the, do the doctrines that the cowboy church teaches, do those doctrines line up with the teaching of the Bible? Well, somebody may be thinking from the outset, what is a cowboy church? While each cowboy church may be a little different, they do have some similarities in common. There's, the, of course, the major idea being uh, the cowboy atmosphere, which sometimes includes a barn or what they refer to as uh, a church or the barn of the Lord is referred to that way some. It's usually associated with that as a roping arena and sometimes a cattle tank, which they'll baptize people in. Uh, they're often ecumenical in nature, meaning that they just accept everybody regardless of what you believe or how you look at it. And many times it's just Baptist doctrine with a cowboy flavor involved in that. Uh, the Silverado Cowboy Church in Weatherford, Texas is one of the largest cowboy churches. And here's what their statement of faith says. Our statement is Silverado Cowboy Church where Jesus is the king of the cowboys and everybody is welcome. And so their purpose is to impact the cowboy culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friend, while taking the gospel to people is good, in the scripture you never see the limitation of putting that to just one culture or just one stereotype as it were. The gospel is for all. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. And so we want to make it available and ready for all to receive. Well, how did the Cowboy Church get its start or when did it start? Most would trace the roots of it to the 1980s, early 90s, where it got its start either in Nashville, Tennessee or Fort Worth, Texas. It was started 
by various leaders, some of them being in the country music uh, area as well. There are two possible founders of the Cowboy Church, either Johnny Cash's sister, Joanne Yates Cash, who's also supposedly an ordained minister at the Nashville Cowboy Church, or Jeff and Sherry Coperhaven, who began the first Cowboy Church in Billy Bob's, Texas, in the bull riding arena in January 1986. Now, we say these things for this purpose. Friend, when did the church that you read about in the Bible start? Is the Cowboy Church the church you read about in the Bible? When did the church that Jesus built start? Well, friend, it didn't start in 1980 or early 1990s. The church Jesus began started in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, thousands of years before the Cowboy Church started. Well, who started the church that you read about in the Bible? Well, Jesus did. Not some country music singer or not some kinfolk of some country music singer or somebody who was big in the cowboy culture. Jesus started His church. Jesus said, I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. The Lord added people to His church in the first century in Acts chapter 2, verse number 47. And so you kind of get the idea of where this is coming from, what's behind this being started, and hopefully that'll help us to see where some of the doctrines come from as well. Let's then turn our attention and examine some of the doctrines, which is really the heart of the matter. Let's examine some of the doctrines of the cowboy church. If you were to go to a cowboy church, and you were to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Here in this cowboy church that I'm standing in right now, what do you teach on salvation? Well, friend, the doctrine of salvation in the cowboy church is very similar, if not identical, to much Baptist doctrine. They believe salvation comes through faith and faith alone. The Silverado Cowboy Church on their website says, salvation of man comes only for accepting Jesus as Savior and being spiritually born again. And so if we believe Jesus is the Son of God and give our life to Him, we can be saved. Well, friend, there's no doubt. Listen carefully. There's no doubt in the Bible that a person must believe in Jesus. The problem is with the only. The salvation of man comes only from accepting Jesus Christ as Savior Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse number 24. As Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling down the road, he's teaching him the gospel. In the distance he sees water. Here's water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. And there's no doubt belief is essential. But is belief the only thing? A person has to do to be saved? Well, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, the Bible teaches the idea of belief alone is contrary to Scriptures. Must a person, think about this with me. Does the Bible teach there's more to do than just believe? Well, let's ask what, from the Scripture what else one must do. Does the Bible say one must repent? Well, yeah, Jesus specifically said that, explicitly said. Luke chapter 13, certain people came to Jesus and they're wondering about these people who died in some great accident. They're wondering about these people who got murdered at the time of sacrifice. And they said, Lord, weren't they worse sinners than everybody else? Wasn't that you or God taking out his vengeance on them? And Jesus looked at them and said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Peter preached, repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. And so the problem with this statement of faith on salvation is when we confine that to only, only believe in Jesus, only be spiritually born again. Well, no, that's not, that's not all there is one must do. In fact, I want you to listen real carefully to this idea. A lot of times I'll hear people talk about faith alone and that all you've got to do to be saved is just have faith in Jesus and we're saved at the point of belief and belief alone. Friend, did you know that the only time we find the words faith alone or faith only in the Bible, God says the exact opposite of what a lot of religious groups are teaching today? Let me say that as clearly as we know how. 
Many religious groups, including the Cowboy Church and various other religious groups, will say, if you, all you got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus. Initially, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Here's what the Bible says. Listen to James chapter 2, verse number 24. You see then that a man is justified by works, here it is, and not by faith only. Now friend, the Bible is not teaching you can earn your way to salvation. The Bible is not teaching if you say enough Hail Marys, you're going to be saved. But there are conditional works that you find throughout the Bible. There are things God says are necessary to do that I've got to do, an action I've got to take to be saved. And the Bible says you're not saved by faith only. The only time faith only occurs in the Bible, it doesn't teach what a lot of people are teaching as well. We're saved by God's grace, are we not? Ephesians 2 verse 8, we're saved by mercy. Titus 3 verse 5, we're saved in hope. Romans 5 verses 1 through 2, there's a multiplicity of things that work into salvation. And so when we limit that to only, friend, that's not God's teaching on salvation. Then as we think about the cowboy church as well, most cowboy churches today are going to believe in the Holy Ghost baptism for people today. For example, the Nashville Cowboy Church says from its website, the baptism with the Holy Ghost is an experience subsequent to conversion, bringing spiritual power for Christian service. Meaning when you're saved, you're going to get the Holy Ghost. You might speak in tongues. You might flail around, whatever it may be. You're going to have some kind of spiritual experience where the Holy Ghost overtakes you, as it were. Well, friend, what do the Scriptures teach about the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost baptism? From what we find in the Scripture, there are two accounts of that. Acts chapter 2, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. The, the Jews on Pentecost, the twelve on Pentecost, were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his household were baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is not a regular occurrence that we see at every example of conversion. You don't find that in the Bible. And so when you think about this idea that, you know, when people are saved, they're going to get the Holy Ghost and they're going to speak in tongues or He's going to overtake them. We only find a couple of examples of that in the Scripture. And what we do know is the work of the Holy Spirit, the miraculous, where men could speak in tongues or people could raise the dead or touch somebody and heal the sick. Friend, that was designed to confirm the Word of God. Mark 16, verse 20, and that had a limited end in sight. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, when that which is perfect has come, that which is incomplete will be done away with. The partial will be done away with, meaning miracles, tongue speaking, miraculous knowledge. That wasn't designed to last forever by God. And so we think about these ideas as well when we consider the doctrines of the cowboy church. Here's another one that we often think about when it comes to denominational doctrine, and it's this. The cowboy church is also heavenly influenced by the doctrine of divine healings, meaning, as the Silverado Cowboy Church says, the gift of the Holy Spirit for today is the same as in the New Testament. The Nashville Cowboy Church says this, the privilege of receiving divine healings for the body in answer to believing prayer. Now friend, there's no doubt that Christians believe in the power of prayer. Is anyone among you sick? Let him pray. But the idea that we have the power for divine healing, again, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, that the partial would be done away with when the complete, when the complete and perfect Word of God was revealed, the partial, tongue speaking, miraculous knowledge, miraculous power, all that was going to be done away with as well. It was not intended by God to last forever. And here's what you've got to consider. If men and women have the ability and the power today to do divine healings, then why aren't we seeing what happened in the first century happening today? Why are there not people who can go out and somebody's got a withered arm and they can straighten it just like that? Why are there not dead people, people who have died, being raised from the dead? And friend, this is probably, I guess, what angers or bothers me the most about this idea is when people claim they have this power of divine healing, 
And yet, there are hundreds of little children sitting in J St. Jude's Hospital right now suffering. And you don't see anybody over there with divine healing doing anything about that. Now, friend, we believe in the power of God in the New Testament, no doubt about that. We believe that power was given to the apostles. The Bible teaches that. But the Bible also teaches that came to an end in the first century and that men and women do not have the miraculous of power today to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to, to heal the lame, and to do like they did in the first century. Do we believe in the power of prayer? Absolutely. Do we believe God still heals through His own power and providence and way? Sure. But to say, some individual has the power of divine healing and to let all those little children in St. Jude's Hospital suffer every day. Friend, somebody's not being honest and fair about that. And so let's really consider the heart of the matter. What the scripture teaches is that power wasn't designed to last forever. Listen to these two passages. Mark 16, 20. And Hebrews 2 verses, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says that God gave miraculous power. Some of that included healing. Some of it included handling snakes. Some of it included drinking poison. He gave that in the first century to confirm the Word of God to people who did not have the complete revealed will of God yet. The Bible had not been revealed completely and given yet. And so here's what you've got. You've got two people who stand up. Imagine this now. You've got two people who stand up and they both say, I have a message from God. I am a prophet of God. One man stands up and speaks his message. The other man stands up and speaks his message. And those messages are diametrically opposed. They're not the same thing. In fact, they're the opposite in some ways. They teach totally different things. Without a Bible, how are you going to know who's right? Well, in the first century, here's how. That man just healed the sick. That man just uh, made the lame well. That man just raised the dead. That is God's confirmation. That's what miracles were, to confirm the word. That's God's confirmation. This is God's spokesman. We need to listen to him. This old fellow over here, he hadn't done anything yet. We don't know about him. We're sure this is God's spokesman. Now, friend, we know today what's true and right because we have the Bible. And if two people stand up and speak, we can look to the Bible and see what's right and true according to the Word of God. And so the idea of divine healing, there's a lot of confusion in the religious world on that subject. And then as we think about the cowboy church, a doctrine that is a big part of a lot of the ecumenical community type cowboy church movements deals with the uh, what we refer to as kind of a health and wealth or social gospel. This doctrine uh, says this, in their tenets of faith, the Silverado Cowboy Church, as well as other cowboy churches, will say that total prosperity is one of their doctrines. And they will mention several things. Total prosperity, spiritually, mental, health, and financial. Meaning, John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you have life and have it more abundantly, and God wants to bless you abundantly spiritually, mentally, with your health, and financially. Friend, as you read the Bible and as you look at some of the great servants of God, no one was ever promised they were going to benefit or be blessed financially in that sense. No one was ever promised. God promised to take care of His own. God promised they would have a home in heaven. God promised He would never leave them for, nor forsake them. But the idea that you're going to have perfect health, hey, tell that to the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. Paul, you will never have to be beaten. Wait a minute now. We don't find that to be in accord with the teaching of the Bible. Paul, if you become a Christian, God's going to bless your bank account. What? Where, where do we read in the Bible that by becoming a Christian, you'll hear this so much in a lot of popular community church, ecumenical type of movement. If you become a Christian, you obey the gospel, God's going to bless your pocketbook. Well, friend, that's just not true. According to the Bible, God will take care of His own. If I seek first the kingdom of God, God will make sure I'm provided for. Matthew 6, God will meet my needs and take care of His own children. But to say that I'm somehow going to be financially wealthy or blessed, again, you just don't find that idea uh, in the Bible. And then, friend, we mention another doctrine of the cowboy church. The cowboy church has a very skewed or false view on the purpose of, 
of baptism. Of course, they believe baptism is to be done by believers only to keep the commands of God. They say, we believe after accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior, one needs to be obedient to Scripture and be water baptized. But then as they, you think about some of their doctrines and ideas, they'll teach that baptism is not essential. You've already accepted Jesus as Lord or Savior, then you need to kind of be baptized later. Much of what is taught in several Protestant religious groups as well is that baptism is not really essential to salvation. And friend, we challenge you to check this in your Bible. You check for yourself and let's see, is one saved? Does one accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, is saved and becomes a Christian and then is baptized later? Is that what the Bible teaches? Not at all. In fact, that idea is clearly contrary to Scripture. Listen to Jesus' words. I want to mention several passages and I want you to listen to these, maybe write them down and you check them in your Bible as well. Mark 16, 16. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. And so think about this. If you believe and are baptized, Jesus said you will be saved. Jesus did not say he who believes only or he who is baptized only, but he who believes and is baptized. Both conjoined together are essential to do to be saved. We don't even believe you're not even a candidate to be saved. Think about the words of the Apostle Peter, the first gospel sermon ever preached. Peter stands up and wonderfully declares, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They were cut to the heart. They realized that was true. They cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Here's what Peter said. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Friend, what did Peter say they had to do to have their sins washed away? Well, stop right there and let's think about it, because I think a lot of times, if we're not careful, we'll miss this idea. What is it that is going to cause people to be lost? Well, sin, right? Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, Sin separate us from a holy and loving God. The wages of sin is spiritual death. Romans 6, 23. Well, friend, when are sins forgiven or removed? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, listen to the reason now, for the remission of sins. I'm saved when my sins are removed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and the Bible says that occurs at baptism. Well, let's listen to the words of Jesus on this subject. We know that Peter said this. What did Jesus say when he spoke to Nicodemus? In John chapter 3, about verses 3 through 5, Nicodemus uh, comes to our Lord. And as he's talking with Christ, Jesus is going to discuss with him about being born again. We hear a lot of people say you need to be born again spiritually. What does it mean, according to the words of Jesus, to be born again spiritually? Unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can't be in God's kingdom, can't be saved unless you're born again. Well, Lord, what do you mean? You want me to go back up? Nicodemus says, what do you mean? You want me to go back up in my mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus says, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born spiritually, born again spiritually, he cannot get into God's kingdom. What about the words of Peter? In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. You know, sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, maybe some of those Bible passages might be referencing some of the things that you're mentioning or talking about, but the Bible never says you've got to be baptized to be saved. Friend, it absolutely does. And not only does it absolutely say that, it explicitly says that. 1 Peter 3, 21 says this, Baptism does now also save us. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. 
Now friend, here's what I want you to think about. There's a lot of denominational groups, a lot of groups that are saying, baptism's good, you, you, you believe in Jesus, you accept Him as Lord and Savior, you're saved, you ought to be baptized two weeks or however long later, and baptism's a great thing to do, it's good to do, we encourage you to do that, but it doesn't save. 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism does now also save us. Teaching of men says, Baptism doesn't save. The Word of God says, Baptism saves us. Now, friend, it saves because that's when we con it's the blood of Jesus that saves. Matthew 26, 28, that's when we contact the death of Jesus. Romans 6, 1 through 4, we're buried with Christ in baptism in which we contact His death. The death, the sacrifice, and the blood of Jesus atones for sin. When did God say, I contact the death of Christ? When we're buried with Him in baptism. That's what Romans 6 verses 1 through 4 says. And so friend, we challenge you today to check your Bible. Get your Bible out, check these things, see if they're true. If you're involved in a religious group, maybe like the Cowboy Church, that is teaching things that are not found in the Bible, and there are a multitude of others that we might could mention, but are teaching things that are not found in the Bible. Friend, we just ask you to see if these things are true. Check them in your Bible for yourself. If they're true, don't obey it because we said do it because that's what God says in the Bible and then you can be sure that you're right with God. Study the Bible for yourself. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, search the scriptures every day and, and see if these things are true and then do it because Jesus said when you obey the truth, the truth will make you free. And as always, Friend, we want you to know that God loves you, that we love you, that we're concerned about your soul, and that more than anything else, we want you to go to heaven. It is the gospel of Christ that is able to save all men from their sins, Romans 1, Romans 1 16, and we encourage people today to obey that gospel, to live by it, and to look forward to that home in heaven with God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee 37111 the Gospel of Christ